All right, hi guys. So basically, I'm gonna be talking about Horace Manning. My name is Marie Castro. So this is one of his schools that was established. He's actually from Massachusetts, which is considered New England here in the United States. So looking at these two pictures, do you guys see any like similarities or any differences? Yes. All right, so what are some similarities and differences you guys see in these pictures? I'll let someone else answer. Okay. Anyone? Any similarities or differences between the two pictures? It looks like it's to be teacher centered. Just are just listening. So uh, one of these pictures is actually from the 1800s and the other one is from like the 2000s. So basically uh, one thing I do want to ask is uh, and that I'm going to be talking about is whose idea was it to start public education and what changes came about it? So we're going to go on and see what, why he was significant. So basically, Curry's Manning was significant. He was born in May 4th, 1796. He was known as the father of public education and he used to practice law before he went to seat in the House of Representatives. So he was basically on an educational board so he was known for his principal and educational reform. So he was championed education that it helped expand state-sponsored public education. So basically what Manning did was he established, uh, he established public education. So these public educations were established by, uh, by the state. And at the time, it only taught white students. And it was basically an effort that he did through property taxes, so everybody could be entitled to a public education. And at the time when he started this, it was often common to, for it to be one room, so all the students were basically in one room. And the reason he did that was so all the students could kind of like meet each other, because at the time, only wealthy students were known to go to school. So he was bringing in these sharecroppers, kids who were once in a farming town, to receive an education, so they were just meeting one another. But that later on changed. So as a result of Manning's principles, he angered people because he was introducing a secular form of education, meaning that you no longer were teaching moral codes. There was no religion taught in his school. So it was a was very, very upset by this. And politicians were very angry because he felt like they were overstepping the boundaries. So I thought it was pretty cool, one of his quotes, it says, under the sublime law of progress, the presence outgrows the past. The great heart of humanity is heavenly with the hopes of a brighter day. All the higher instincts of our natural prosperity is approached, and the best intellects of the race are struggling to turn that prophecy into fulfillment. So I found that quite interesting because at the period in time in the 1800s, when he was around, people were still teaching based on Calvinism, which is John Calvin, a Protestant reformer, and he wanted to make education for all. So Manning had this principles of education, so he had these standards set. So basically these standards, I could say they're similar to our in-text standards that we learn now, but his uh, standards were that teachers had to have this rigorous setting because before teachers, anybody could be a teacher. You could be like, oh, I know this, I'm calling myself a teacher. So he did it away with that and he's like, hey, we need some training. So he established training and teachers needed to know this content knowledge, pedagogy and instructional methods. So basically his six principles were like, citizens cannot maintain both ignorance and freedom. Education should be paid for and controlled by the public. Education should be provided in schools that embrace children from different backgrounds. Education must be non-secular. Education must be taught using tenets of a free society. And education must be provided by well-trained professional teachers. So basically a result of his principles, they were still like agriculture at the time. So students still had to go to school doing according to what was being grown. So they were still like, I guess I would call it a farming schedule. 
And the common schools were funded by local tax. They did not charge tuition. It was basically for white students. And it was still funded by elected officials. And Manning advocated for a statewide curriculum and an institution's school finance through local property tax. So at the time, uh, most children were learning how to read, write, and spell from Noah's Webster. So he definitely changed it to the McGuffrey Reader, which helped students become more fluent in their reading. And after that, he included the age grading system. So that's whenever school started, when students started going to schools, to their classrooms, according to their age, instead of being all in the same classroom. As a result of that, uh, later on, the Morrell Grant was, was passed. And the Morrell Grant is basically some achievement for higher education. So most of our colleges, as we know, are, are part of the Morrell Grant, Morrell Line Grant. So this basically is a grant that was established to give every state 30,000 acres of land for them to establish a college. So I thought that was really neat and the fact that this happened in 1862 after, after his death and it was just, it led to, it was because of his statement and access he did starting public education that it led to higher education being public as well. And part of the second Morrell Act is whenever African-American students were able to start attending schools. So until uh, this day, there is like A&M as part of Morrell Act, and also Cornell, which is a very uh, prestigious university. And I like this other quote he put, education then be beyond all other devices of human origin is a great equalizer of the condition of men, the balancing wheel of the social machinery. So uh, basically, some of the education, uh, be besides the in-text standards, because I honestly feel like he was the founding father of that as well. He's the one that led these um, these rigorous structures for teachers. You know, like he's the one that said, no, teachers cannot just not be anyone. Teachers need to go to school and be certified. They need to have this common core between all of them. So the common school movement was an effort that began in the early 1800s. It provided free education to all students, regardless of wealth, heritage, or class. So one of the standards that really stuck out to me was professional learning and ethical practice, because the teacher will understand these laws to, in order to help students move forward. So the, I want to end my presentation with, do not think of knocking out another person's brains because he differs in an opinion from you. It would be as rational to knock yourself on the head because you differ from yourself 10 years ago. And this uh, quote to me reflected as the common school movement that he did, where also in the beginning he had all the school, all the students attend one room. And later on he changed it where students were attending by their ages. And that ends my presentation. Any questions for Marie? Any questions for Marie about the common school movement? Everyone's quiet today. What's going on? Wednesday and it's raining. I know it's Wednesday, but it's still the middle of the week. We need to be perky and excited. Marie, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, hey, Marie, this is Araceli. Um, my uh, camera's not working too well. I was just gonna ask you from, um, you know, this school, what was the most interesting, what, what caught your eye the most? Well, uh, basically like public education was not accessible to all, and this is the 1800s, right? So only white students at the time could go to school. So what caught my attention was that he was making these standards and he was implementing that teachers need to be trained in order for them to teach. Before you could be like, I'm a teacher, I know this and this. 
And therefore you could call yourself a teacher, right? You didn't need a degree. You didn't need to prove yourself to anyone else. So with his goals, he set standards saying teachers must know this. Teachers are to know this. Teachers have this instruction they need to go by. So it was, then he then he then called it the norm school, what we know now. Okay, thank you, Marie. And it was so much information over him, I guess, since he's like the founder of education and such. Yes, no, it was very informative. Thank you. We do know that a lot of the, um, they began to open up several normal schools after the first one uh, across the country. Even they had normal schools for African American teachers. Um, those normal schools eventually became universities in some states and cities um, that were training teachers. They eventually expanded into um, universities um, for um, African American students. That was very informative. Any other questions for Marie? Okay, we're gonna get ready for our next presenter, uh, Maria Yanis.